Welcome back, welcome back Tenfold Us, welcome to Tenfold Life, a show that is proudly brought to you with lots of love by Liberty. A very special shout out goes out to the people that are not only supporting this show, but they're also uh, supporting our app, which is called the Tenfold Education app. If you haven't done so, please go to your app store and download this awesome, awesome app that is packed with a lot of very useful goodies for you. Can you 10, 11, or 12 medicine science student? This is just for you. Remember, on YouTube, you're also available. We are Mindset Learners, so do make sure that you go there. And you also uh, check out the stuff that we've uploaded, and you like that particular uh, channel, and you follow all, all the stuff that we've uploaded for you there. I promise you, that will help you to ace your exams. We're continuing with analyzing errors and misconceptions that metrics are likely to make to help you not to make the same mistakes. And now we're going to part two. So part two is based on sequences and series. So let's go and check that out. Right. So uh, in sequences and series, there are only four things that you have to be aware of. You're going to get questions on the arithmetic sequence and series, the geometric sequence and series, the quadratic sequence only, and then there's also uh, the sigma notation. Okay, cool. Now, when you go to the arithmetic sequence, in fact, before we even go anywhere, I think it's important for us to let you know that you are likely to pick the wrong formula. So one of the most popular errors or misconceptions we've seen is that the matrix, they always use the wrong, okay? The wrong formula, the incorrect formula for a particular pattern. Now that's wrong, it means that you don't know your basics. And like I said before, it really helps for you to understand your basics. And the arithmetic pattern will have a common difference. The general term of this will be a plus n minus one multiplied with d. The sum will be sn is n over two into two a plus n minus one d. So that's just unique to arithmetic for the geometric the general term has a common ratio, okay? So it's important for you to understand that when you're doing this one, you're going to have R's involved in it. So do not confuse them, okay? There's a restriction that R cannot be one. This is where sum to infinity also comes in. So please be careful of that and do not confuse the formulas. The quadratic pattern is the one that says, uh, okay, not T, but TN, okay? I wanted to write a pattern for you here, but I think you guys understand what is going on. So AN squared plus BN plus C will be the general term for this. It does not have a sum formula because we do not do those in the trick, okay? So, so these are the ideas. So using the wrong formula is one of the popular errors that we see. So please do make sure that you understand the difference. What makes a pattern arithmetic? It is a common difference. What makes a pattern geometric? It is a common ratio. What makes a pattern quadratic? It has what we call a second common difference. Now in arithmetic, I'm just gonna use the arithmetic to actually explain this story. One of the errors that we see a lot is that when you have maybe something that looks like this, you have got a pattern that has uh, x plus one, 2x as well as x minus 3 and then somebody tells you that you're looking at an arithmetic pattern. In your mind you know that for me to find the solution for the value of x I need t2 minus t1 to be equal to t3 minus t2. So the order of subtraction is important. Please do make sure you take term 2, you subtract t1. But now what we've noticed is that people always write this. For term 2 you know that two term 2 is 2x. So you're now writing 2x, now you're subtracting term 1 which is x plus 1. You equate that to 10, 3, which is x minus 3, you're subtracting 2x. There's a mistake. Where is the mistake? The mistake is exactly here, okay? You are not subtracting correctly because you have to subtract term 1. Term 1, okay, has two terms, which is x plus 1. So you have to make sure that you include the brackets. If you don't include the brackets, then this is not going to be correct because you need to multiply the x and multiply the one with the negative one that lies outside of the bracket. So in, in, in conclusion, you will end up having uh, 2x minus x minus one is equals to x minus three minus two. I know you, you, you can put brackets here and survive, but if you do not put them on the left-hand side, you would be in trouble. On the right-hand side, if you didn't put them, you would not actually get the wrong solution because 2x, which is term two, happens to have one term. So because you're subtracting one term, if you didn't have brackets, you will still survive. But in the on the, on the left-hand side, if you did not put that x plus one in brackets, you were not going to get the correct solution. Okay, very important. 
Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is what is called uh, the, co the comparison between terms and subs. So I'm going to just uh, roll here. Okay, we'll come back and talk about uh, sigma notation. Okay, let's, let's just maybe uh, add more space here and talk about terms versus subs. Now, terms versus sums is actually a very interesting battle because sometimes the statement that you're given talks about sums and you guys don't know what to do. Here's a very important uh, comparison. Imagine if I said to you the sum of uh, the first 10 terms, okay, 10 terms uh, is anything, let's say 200. That question versus, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, sum, again, I'm saying the sum of the 10th uh, and 11th term is 200. Now, what we notice is, generally speaking, uh, you guys don't know the comparison with difference between these two, so you always, always make mistakes. On the first one, we are given the sum. The sum is given and the sum is 200. So it will be okay to use the SN formula. Let's just say the pattern is arithmetic, okay? Okay, let's say in an arithmetic pattern. Okay, even this side, let's say in an arithmetic pattern. So what you would do is you will use a sum formula, okay? Very important for you to understand the difference between when terms are given and when the sums are given. So that, 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 that 200 will be the value of the sum. That's what you're going to substitute here. And this 10 will be your n. So you will have 200 equals to 10 halves. And then we don't know what a is. It can be anything, uh, but your n value is 10. And the difference is going to be whatever it is, and you can be able to uh, solve this, this, this problem. Now, when you go to the, to the right-hand side, yes, it says sum here. But we are not saying the sum of the first 10 terms. We're giving you a number, the 10th term, which is just one thing. This is a thing, and this is also a thing. So it means term 10. Add it with term 11 will give you a sum of 200. Now, it implies that when you're solving this one, you cannot use the SN formula. It will be wrong. So you will have to use this formula, which is the term formula, because the examiner is talking about terms. Okay, very important, very, very, very important. It's 200, and of course, in the first one, you're going to have uh, uh, an n value of 10, and in the second one, you're going to have an n value of 11, and then you can be able to try and, and solve this question. But what I want you to understand is do not treat the problem on the right-hand side the same as you would treat the problem on the left-hand side. The left-hand side, we're given the sum of term 1 plus term 2 plus term 3, all the way up to term 10. So we can use the sum formula. But on the right-hand side, we do not have the sum of consecutive terms, but we've got a sum of a number and another number. These are unique terms that are hand-picked from a group of terms, so please, please do make sure that you don't mess that up. All right. Now, going back to uh, what we have at the top in your sequence and series. So uh, I'm just interested in discussing with you what happens when you are looking at sigma notation. What are general errors that we see when we're dealing with sigma notation? Now, what we've noticed is that, uh, of course, we all know the sigma symbol. And uh, you will notice that, let's say, for example, we've got a question that has got the sum of 2p from p equals to negative 1 up to p equals to 20. All right? And they want you to calculate this. The question will just say calculate. So what we naturally generally see is people will, will put 2 into negative 1 and then, and then 2 into negative 2 and then 2 into negative 3. And I'm sure you can see that this is actually going in the wrong direction. We have to keep adding one. Your brain says after one comes two, after two comes three, but you're going in the wrong direction. Yes, you have to start with negative one, but according to the number line, we know if this is zero, and this is negative one, and this is negative two, and this is one, and this is two, if this is your starting point at one, you have to increase and go to the right hand side. So the correct way of doing this would be to say two into negative one. Yes, we have to start at negative one, and then you add this with two into zero, and then you add this into two into one, and then two into two, and then, and so on and so on. And then you're gonna get terms, which you can add by using the appropriate formula for summing there. 
up, so please be careful uh, of the toe. It's negative one, then zero, and then one, then two, because we are going to the right. We're going to the right, we are increasing by one, going to the right and not going to the left, so please, please be careful of, of that particular error. It's a common error that you see almost uh, all the time. Now, we're going to go to uh, functions. Now, functions and inverses, these are graphs, okay? So when you go to graphs, it's important for us to understand that graphs are not actually complicated. What is the most problem when we're dealing with graphs is just you guys don't have the understanding of the basic concepts that include graphs. So do make sure that you iron out those and you understand your basics. Understanding the concepts that are involved in graphs is so important. Everything else will just be you making silly uh, mistakes and uh, uh, errors. Remember, a misconception is when you think you know something and you're confident that you know something, it's only find that you're wrong, you've got a wrong idea about the thing. Okay, that's what we are here to iron out and the errors that you generally make. Okay, so let's jump right into functions and inverses and look at what are the common errors that the matrix usually make when they're doing functions and inverses. Right. So uh, this is part three of our, uh, uh, of our show. So this talks about functions and inverses. Remember, there's going to be a linear function. There's going to be a quadratic function. And there's also going to be a rational function. This is basically the hyperbola. You're going to have the exponential function. A logarithm rhythmic function is actually the inverse of an exponent. So it's not necessarily a standalone function. It's just the inverse of the exponential function. Now, going back up to start, first of all, by looking at what are the general errors that matrix make when they're doing functions, okay? So I'm going to draw them here. These are general errors for all the functions. Number one, you guys always make the mistake of not answering the question. When you're asked for coordinates of intercepts with the axis, you have to always put coordinates in coordinate form. Okay, so if I give you two questions, they say I say to you uh, y is x squared minus 2x minus 8, and also say to you y is, is the second function, x minus 2 squared uh, minus 8. First of all, these are parabolas, okay, we can all see them, they are actually quadratic functions. What is the mistake that you can make? If I ask you for the y-intercept, one of the popular errors we see is that you guys see for the y-intercept, y equals to negative 8. You're looking at this number because you know that if x becomes 0, this will die, and this will die, and this negative 8 is going to be the y-coordinate of the y-intercept. But you leave it like this. And this here, Kretovs, is actually incorrect because we're asking you for coordinates. When we ask for coordinates, this will be a correct, an incorrect solution. We would like you to write it in point form, so the correct solution will be the y-intercept is given by an x value of 0, which will lead to a y value of negative 8. Now, what we've noticed is that you guys think just because this is a y-intercept in this standard form, okay, when you go to this form, that is also supposed to be the y-intercept, and this is actually very wrong. So if you got that question and I asked you for the y-intercept and you said to me, oh, the y-intercept is going to be 0 and negative 8. That is a mistake. It's a common error we see almost all the time. You guys have to realize that we want you to replace x with 0 in order to work out the y-intercept. So when you replace x as 0 there, it's not going to delete the negative 2 and the square because those will contribute to subtracting 8 and then you're going to get a different answer. So please, please, please be careful of that. It's another popular error that we see. So uh, the one intercept for that in point form again, coordinate. So when you put zero there, you're going to get zero. Uh, minus two is going to be negative two squared. You get the, you get a value of four. From four, if you subtract eight, you're going to get a y value of negative four. So in point form, please be careful of that. That's another popular error that you see almost all the time. Now, moving right along with functions. The other thing that we always see is when you're dealing with asymptotes, okay? When you're dealing with asymptotes, which graphs have asymptotes? Let me maybe draw your attention to uh, the hyperbola. We all know what the hyperbola looks like. Let's assume that you were given the hyperbola y, or f of x is 7 over x minus 2 plus 1. Number 1, I want to ask for the equations of the asymptotes, okay? You cannot write, uh, we know what where this comes from. It comes from 
y is a over x minus p plus q. Everybody knows this, okay? But when I ask for the equation of the asymptote, you guys cannot, not, not, you cannot. You can't say p equals to 2 and then say to me q equals to 1. No, we don't do this. The, the, the equations that I'm looking for are supposed to be x is 2, okay? And you have to say to me y is 1. These are the ones that I want, okay? These are the ones that I want. The blue ones are wrong, okay? Please do not, do not make that mistake. So you have to have to be uh, very careful. And the worst thing you can do is when I ask you for uh, equations. If I say find me the equations of the asymptotes, it will be completely incorrect for you to put them in point form and put two and one. This is actually very, very, very wrong. Don't do that. Unless if I ask you for the coordinates of the point where they meet each other. Other than that, when I ask for equations, put them in equation form. Remember, the line x equals to two is the vertical one, okay? Vertical one, and then the line y equals to one is a horizontal asymptote. So, so please do make sure that you don't confuse those. And then lastly, in closing, okay, uh, when we ask you to compare a function and its inverse, what you've noticed is that people always uh, confuse those, okay? And I'm going to use the log here to try and talk about uh, what happens when we ask you to, to analyze a graph and its inverse. The log graph, okay, and the exponential graph are inverses of each other. So these guys are inverses. If this is f, this one is going to be f uh, inverse, okay? It's the inverse graph of the exponential graph. Now, if you have worked out information for the original graph, you do not have to calculate from scratch the features of the new one, okay? You just simply have to swap them. What am I saying? Well, I'm saying if this is my function and this is my inverse function, okay? And maybe let's say I've got a y-intercept of 0 and 1. I've got an x-intercept uh, of, let's just say, 2 and 0. I've got maybe, let's say, an asymptote. Uh, this is maybe, let's say I had, I had like a, uh, an exponential graph and this is the information I've found, okay? Y is negative 2, I can have the domain and I can also have the range. It doesn't really make any difference. Whatever I have, the key thing here is when somebody starts asking me about the inverse, I don't have to recalculate anything. The inverse will just simply be all this stuff swapped around. What was X will now become Y. What was the Y-intercept becomes the x-intercept and the coordinates swap around. What does the x-intercept now becomes the y-intercept, okay? The coordinates uh, swap around. What was the asymptote y equals to uh, negative two becomes the asymptote x equals to negative two y because y is changing to x. And what was the domain is gonna be the range in the inverse. Not was the range is going to be the domain in the inverse. So you don't have to redo any fresh recalculations. All you have to do is just take what you have done and just do this whole swap swap situation in order to get the solutions of what the features of the inverse are going to be. We're still coming back with more. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.